Death Camps Robert Conquest Oxford University Press Oxford New York Toronto Melbourne Kingsley and Jane Amis Acknowledgements Acknowledgements are due to the sources, quoted in the text, mainly ex-prisoners, and in particular to Vladimir Petrov, Eleanor Lipper, Michael Solomon and the late Varlam Shalimov, and also to Lloyds of London who helped me with their records, to Anna Borgina of the Hoover Institution, Stanford, and to Marie Collett, for her invaluable assistance in preparing the material. Contents Introduction 3i, The Middle Passage Asterisk 92, in 2 colima 3631938 Baptism, of Horror 49 for the Social Order of Colima 675 Gold, Under Ice, The Colima Economy 1046 Living and Dying Conditions 1257 Women, 1768 A Clownish Interlude, 2009 The Death Roll 214 Appendix A Ships on the Colima Run, 232 Appendix B Camps and Camp Groups 234 Bibliography and References 243 Index, 246 Maps USSR showing the Colima Region and Sea Routes 8 to 9, the Colima Region 10 N. USSR showing the Colima Region and Sea Routes. Colima Region The present work is a documentation, from a number of sources, both Soviet and Western, in which I seek to establish beyond Kivil the history, and the conditions of the huge labor camp complex, of Koalima. Asterisk Koalima constitutes, it is true, only one section of the archipelago, as Solzhenitsyn has so aptly named it of the NKVD's penal empire, scattered throughout the vast territories of the Soviet North and East. But just as Auschwitz has come to stand for the Nazi extermination camps as a whole, so Kolyma remains fixed in the imagination of the Soviet peoples as the great archetype of the sinister system under which Stalin ended by hunger, cold and exhaustion, the lives of so many of his subjects. It was natural, during a celebrated debate among Soviet historians in the early 60s, that when Dr. Bisnegov was denouncing the Stalin heritage, and was pressed by the Stalinist historian Devarin, to say did he belong to the Soviet or the anti-Soviet camp, he should have retorted, I belong to the Kolyma camp. The sinister reputation of the Kolyma camps is of course, primarily due to the fact that of the mass imprisonment areas at least, it was the deadliest. There seem, indeed to have been camps on the Arctic islands of Novaya Zemlya, from which no one returned at all. But of these practically asterisk the accent falls on the last syllable. Nothing is known, and they were certainly on a smaller scale. In Kolyma, millions died. And it is possible, owing to the special circumstances of the area, to obtain reasonable estimates of the numbers. The point here is that Kolyma was supplied by sea. And we have some knowledge of the number of ships in service, their capacity, and the number of trips they made a year. This isolation from the mainland, as the prisoners always referred to it, coupled with the fact that the area is in the furthest corner of the enormous Soviet territory, contributed greatly to the prisoners' feeling of having been removed irrevocably from the normal world, an effect especially powerful for inhabitants of the great landmass. It also produced characteristics hardly to be found in the rest of the archipelago for example, that precautions against escape were less thorough, since escape in any real sense was virtually impossible. It thus seems not only comparatively simple to treat this separate area in isolation, but also peculiarly appropriate to do so. Particularly as Solzhenitsyn himself, though he gives us a few illuminating pages, on the area, says in the Gulag Archipelago, I have almost excluded Kolyma from the compass of this book. As he notes, there are several accounts of Kolyma, by Soviet writers, as well as others, which he did not know, of at the time, by former inmates in the West. What I have done, in effect, is to bring these accounts, together on a reasonably systematic basis, to give as full and irrefutable a picture, as possible of this dreadful monument, to inhumanity. I have relied basically on 17 main first-hand accounts 16, from ex-prisoners, and 1, from a free employee. In addition, I have used a few major reports, and analyses published in the West or in the Soviet press, together with some hitherto unpublished information.
Of the major first-hand accounts, 12 were provided by witnesses who had reached the West and 5 by witnesses remaining in the Soviet Union. Of the latter, two were actually published in Moscow, and the two others, though originally intended for Soviet publication, were finally refused this and were later published in the West. But, none of the writers were prosecuted for their revelations. Ten of these testimonies are from present or former Soviet citizens. Four from Poles, one from a Romanian, one from a Swiss, and one from a German. Thirteen are from men and four from women, two of the latter among the most valuable. And in addition to these I have relied to a lesser extent on half a dozen unpublished witnesses, former victims, whose testimony is summarized by Roy Medvedev, in Let History Judge, by Dalin and Nikolevsky in Forced Labor in Soviet Russia, by Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago, and elsewhere as well as by the evidence based on the affidavits of 63 Polish prisoners, summarized in Sylvester Mora's booklet Kolyma. The experience of these men and women extends from the earliest beginnings of Kolyma in 1932 to 1933 to the rehabilitations, which started to take place in 1954. And their broad range of background and experience seems more than adequate to provide a clear, full and irrefutable picture of Kolyma. It has often been pointed out that while Auschwitz and Maidenich are known the world over, the Soviet equivalents are not. Since the publication of the Gulag Archipelago, the existence and nature of the Soviet camp system, in general has penetrated the world's consciousness, but except in the Soviet Union itself, this has been as a system, and far less as a local habitation, and a name for Russians and it is surely right that this should become true for the world, as a whole Kolyma is a word of horror wholly comparable to Auschwitz, and the first and easiest point to remember is that it did indeed kill some three million people, a figure well in the range of that of the victims of the final solution. It is not my purpose to argue whether Stalin's mass murders were worse than Hitler's or vice versa. Both were on a horrible scale, and both were conducted with such inhumanity that such comparisons seem odious. We may indeed note certain differences. Hitler's atrocities were carried out against those he had himself declared to be his enemies. Stalin's were a random operation against his own subjects and supporters. Stalin, simply because he had a longer period to operate in and a larger pool of potential victims, killed a good many more than Hitler did. A final difference is of course asterisk that Stalin found defenders among sensitive-minded liberals in the West and Hitler did not. Moreover Stalin's terror was one of the foundation stones of a system which, far from being part of history, flourishes to this day. The resources of Kolyma, so long developed at the expense of prisoners' lives, are now largely exploited by free labor, backed by adequate machinery. But its name remains in the Russian mind, as epitomizing more than any other the horrors of the Stalin era. Nor has the change been complete. There are still labor camps in Kolyma, as elsewhere in Russia. In 1971 Andrei Malryk was sent to serve out a sentence in a strict regime camp in the area, FPR the crime of spreading falsehoods against the Soviet state and the system. These were of course nothing of the kind, but merely expressions of opinions or statements of fact and welcome to the KGB, for the secret police still exists and still administers even if on a smaller scale, the Gulag Archipelago of which Kolyma, beyond the icy waters of the Okhotsk Sea, was the most dreadful and distant island. The way in which the memory of Kolyma still haunts the Soviet present may be seen in a case which came part a coup. Larley vividly to public notice, in 1976, with the publication in the West of the autobiography of G.R.G. Vince, the Soviet Reform Baptist leader, under the significant title Three Generations of Suffering. Pastor Vince, who had himself already been imprisoned for his religious activities and was to be again, after publication of the book, deals with the earlier sufferings of his father, in the same cause, which ended with death in Kolyma, in December 1943. Basically, the frightfulness of Kolyma was due not to geographical or climatic reasons, but to conscious decisions taken in Moscow. For a few years before 1937, in effect greater than asterisk asterisk was well administered, and the death rate was low. The climate, though exceedingly cold, is a remarkably healthy one for men who are properly fed, clothed and sheltered. 
In this earlier phase, the main aim of the administration was to produce gold efficiently. In the later period as one commandant put it quite openly, though the gold remained important, the central aim was to kill off the prisoners. In the earliest period of the labor camp system, the Salavki camps on the islands of the White Sea were the symbol of the whole system, the worst killers. These were followed, in the mid-30s, by the camps of the Baltic White Sea Canal. Kolama took their place just when the system was reaching its maximum expansion, and remained central to it for the next 15 years, as in Solzhenitsyn's words, the pole of cold and cruelty, of the labor camp system. Chapter 1 The Middle Passage Death Ships of the Okhotsk Sea and Ray Sakharov We take up the story of the endless stream of victims as they arrive on the Soviet Pacific shore, on the seas beyond which lay their eventual destination Kolomas port of Nagoyevo, its central staging area at Magadan, and behind them, the camps and mines of the interior. For readers will be familiar with the earlier stages in the sufferings of the victim of the Great Purge. From his nighttime arrest, his life in the incredibly overcrowded cells of the Batyrka, or the Lefortovo, or the Lubyanka, or Leningrad's Kursti, or Schleperny prisons, or in one of the hundreds of prisons of the lesser cities. The interrogation, at which confession to an entirely false charge, was obtained by the continuous questioning without sleep of the conveyor, or by physical torture. Then the days or weeks, in the crowded and lightless cattle truck, of the prison train, conveying him to his camp. We will begin then, with the prisoners arriving at the huge transit camps on the Pacific coast, outside Vladivostok and later at Nakodka, and at Vanino, in each of which a hundred thousand prisoners would be crowded into the endless array of barracks, which stretched as far as the eye could see. There they awaited the prison ships of the Kolam Iran. Those who arrived were already crushed, and humiliated starved, and ill-clad remnants of human beings. They would normally have spent around three months in prison under conditions and treatment thought adequate to such as they. And the train journey always, one of the worst of the various experiences of the victims, with its fetid wagons, its inadequate water supply, its lack of food and light, its brutal guards, was of course the longest undergone by any of Gulag's victims. 28 days, 33 days, 35 days, 47 days are typical times reported. On arrival they piled out of the train, and were at once surrounded, by guards with dogs. They would be told to squat, and the guards would shout the routine warning, asterisk if anyone stands up we shall take it as an attempt to escape and shoot instantly. All quite normal. After a checking of documents by the train guards and the camp guards, the consignment of prisoners would be marched off to the transit camps. These huge camps do not need to be described in great detail. Life in them resembled in most aspects the general camp life of the archipelago. The differences were mainly in the absence of physical labor, and the knowledge of impermanence. At the Vladivostok transit camp, in the 30s, there were two zones, one for common criminals and one for counter-revolutionaries. The former had heated barracks blankets, mattresses and other luxuries not available, at the latter. In the counter-revolutionary section, there was always a grave shortage of water, which produced fights. Still, this was better than the company of the criminals. When the Vladivostok camp was moved to Nakodka, at the beginning of the war, and the Vanino camp, much further north, later opened up, such segregation was no longer practiced. The tough General Gorbatov was both cheated, and violently robbed at Nakodka. There was the usual despoilment of all possessions, including overcoats, by thieves at Vanino. It is not certain when it was that Vanino, just north of Sovitskaya Gavin, became fully operational. Though nearer both to central Russia and by sea to Nagevo, it at first had no rail connection to the Trans-Siberian. There was a large camp in the area as early as 1940, though it is not clear whether this was already a main transit camp for Kolyma. One of several reported strikes by Polish prisoners to secure delivery of their rations is reported there in that year, involving finally several thousand men, including Russians and others. It resulted in mass machine gunning. At whichever camp, once settled in, prisoners tried to take advantage of the vast crowds to meet acquaintances. Everyone hoped to find husbands or other close relatives, but with a woman serving a sentence, which took her to Kolyma, the husband had almost invariably been shot. 
One girl of Evgenia Ginsburg's group did meet her brother, who gave her a small pillow and blamed himself for her arrest. She later gave him the pillow back as the only thing she had before boarding the Jerma. He was shot in 1944 for anti-Soviet talk in camp to be rehabilitated in the 1950s. For asterisk many prisoners, of course, died in the transit camps. Those we know of include the Russian poet Asip Mandelstam and the Polish poet Bruno Jasiansky. General Gorbatov tells of an old colleague, I met Ushakov, former commander of the 9th Division. We flung our arms around each other and of course wept. Ushakov had once been thought a man of culture, the best of the divisional commanders. Here he was a foreman, in charge of nine camp kitchens, and still considered himself asterisk superior figures, refer to the bibliography and references at p. 243. Fortunate to have such privileged work. Ushakov never reached Kolyma because of his health. An old soldier, he had been wounded 18 times, fighting the Basmachi in Central Asia. He had received four medals for his military service. While we were at Nakodka Bay Ushakov's fate, for no apparent reason, took a turn for the worse. He was demoted from foreman and put on heavy physical labor. Five and so died. Mrs. Ginsburg describes the death of a friend, almost fleshless, blind and disfigured with scurvy, whom not even the bugs of the transit camp would approach. The bugs were so legendary, even by camp standards, that they are reported in almost all the prisoners' accounts, as provoking every night a struggle, which would last till dawn. As soon as it got barely warm enough, prisoners would move out of the barracks and sleep on the ground, only to be followed by a veritable procession of the virulent insects. Lice too abounded. The disinfestation chambers worked inefficiently. A typhus epidemic, as a result, swept the camp in 1938, causing tens of thousands of deaths. Over the following year, a new camp commandant finally improved the dealsing system and brought the epidemic under control. The survivors of this and of mere starvation would when the time came, be checked for working capacity. At the Vanino camp, in 1949, a regular slave market was in operation. Officials from various mining areas, accompanied by doctors, would examine the wares. One group is reported to have had a standing contract with the NKVD for 120,000 laborers a year. Asterisk they felt men's muscles, opened their mouths to check their teeth, and looked at eyes, head and shoulders. 31 as elsewhere, the method of testing for dystrophy was to pinch the buttocks. If the muscle was still elastic the prisoner was judged as not in so advanced a condition as to be unfitted for hard labor. Embarkation day would arrive at Vanino. When we came out onto the immense field outside the camp I witnessed a spectacle that would have done justice to a Cecil B. Demilly production slash as far as the eye could see there were columns of prisoners marching in one direction or another like armies on a battlefield. A huge detachment of security officers, soldiers, and signal corpsmen with field telephones and motorcycles kept in touch with head carters, arranging the smooth flow of these human rivers. I asked what this giant operation was meant to be. The reply was that each time a transport was sent off the administration, reshuffled the occupants of every cage in camp so that everyone had to be removed with his bundle of rags on his shoulder to the big field and from there directed to his new destination. Only 5,000 were supposed to leave but 100,000 were part of the scene before us. One could see endless columns of women, of cripples, of old men, and even teenagers, all in military formation, five in a row, going through the huge field and directed by whistles or flags. It was more than three hours before the operation was completed and the batch I belonged to was allowed to leave for the embarkation point 31 in these camps depending on the time of year a prisoner might be held for only a few days or if he arrived after the end of the navigation season from early December until late April. After the trains the camp, at any rate in summer and in the absence of epidemics, had afforded somewhat of a relief. It had been possible, if not to eat much, at least to breathe and to rest a little. Those who missed this break in the journey were at their worst. A Soviet writer tells of one such party of men. Before they had had time to recover from their train journey they were marched a distance of several miles towards the port. 
There was a hitch over the supply of bread, so the men went off on empty stomachs. After an hour or two, in the broiling sun, they began to collapse. Some of them died on the spot. The survivors sat down and declared that they would go no further until they were given bread. Such an organized protest was a rare occurrence among politicals who had all been party members and were used to discipline. The frightened guards went berserk, kicked the dead bodies about after the manner of the good soldier Schweik's doctors take this malingerer to the morgue and shot several stragglers who attempted to escape. For there were lesser inconveniences too. After hours of shunting, on the way to the piers, as the people I had under supervision were all sick, they asked me for permission to leave their place long enough to relieve themselves. Being protected, personnel I addressed myself in turn to a soldier watching us carrot and asked him to grant permission for the sick to do so. I did it in the official Russian form. Is it allowed by you that some sick people should attend to their urgent necessities? Those who are bored with life, the officer replied should just make one step out of the column and they will be through with it. 31 and so finally, the columns wound down to the boats. It was for the great majority of the prisoners their first sight of the open sea, for almost all of them, their first sea voyage. On the Russians, in particular, the effect of the long cruise northward over the open ocean greatly enhanced the feeling already common to prisoners that they had been removed from the ordinary world. It seemed not merely a transportation from the mainland, as the prisoners always referred to the rest of the country, merely to some distant penal island, but even to another planet, as Koalima was always called in its songs and sayings. One of the many more recent unofficial ballads about the camps the widespread singing of, which by Soviet students in private groups so strikingly illustrates the way in which Stalin's terror still haunts the Russian consciousness, is Galik's Magadan. Three it begins. One remember Vanino port, where the grim-looking steamer rode, how we climbed the gangplank, aboard to the cold and gloomy hold, the ships of Koalima's middle passage, were mainly tramp steamers built, at Flensburg and Newcastle, Sheedham and Tacoma, which had previously had such names, as ironically enough, commercial Quaker or Puget Sound. They were mostly in the range of 5,000 to 7,000 gross tons, though some were as small as not much more than 2,000 tons. The biggest, the Nikolai Yezhov changed when he became an unperson. To Felix Jerzhinsky was just over 9,000 tons. She had originally been a cable ship, and it had caused considerable surprise when the Soviet government bought her in the mid-30s, since it was not known to be conducting or planning any laying of cables. Such, however, was not the intention. The huge cable holds made splendid floating dungans. However, there seemed to have been disadvantages. At any rate many years later, she was turned into a fisheries vessel. At the other end of the scale was the Indijerka built at Greenock in 1886 and grossing only 2336 tons, which finally proved unable to ride the Okhotsk storms and sank in December 1939. The shipwreck of another prison vessel, with the loss of 5,000 prisoners and an escort of 200, is noted in July 1949. And there were other losses, such as the reported blowing up of the ship Dalstroy, in Nakutka Harbor, in 1946, apparently by Latvian and Lithuanian nationalists, among the prisoners. The convicts had not yet gone aboard, but supplies of aminal, the explosive used in the gold mines, had already been loaded. Great destruction was caused in the town. There was no proof of responsibility, but many Latvians and Lithuanians seemed to have been shot. The core of the slave fleet were Thed Herma the Dalstroy. And from 1940, the Sovletvia, which operated on the route throughout most of the period. The Jerma, of just under 7,000 tons, was built in Holland in 192-1. The Dalstroy, also of Dutch origin, had the same tonnage. The Sovletvia, of just over 4,000 tons, was built in Sweden for the independent Latvian government in 1926 and taken over after the Soviet annexation of that republic. These ships were actually part of Dalstroy's the NKVD, Far Northern Construction Trust's own fleet, as were for long periods vessels, such as the Felix Jerzhinsky and the Kulu. And their port of registry was Nagevo itself. Each bore a broad white band, with a blue stripe, on its smokestack, and the letters DS, for Dalstroy the blue, and white officially signifying hope. 
Other ships, registered in Vladivostok or Nakutka, served mainland administrations, and were made available, for the Nagevo run by arrangement. Mrs. Ginsburg describes the Cherma, in 1939, when the ship had many years, ahead of her on the Nagevo run. She was an old ship, that had seen better days. Her railings, stairways and even the captain's megaphone were dull, and covered with vertigris. Now she was used solely for moving convicts. For she is first reported, in these waters in 1933, when she sailed, laden with an above-capacity load of prisoners, said to have numbered as many, as 12,000, from Vladivostok, through the Bering Straits to Ambarkic, at the mouth of the Kolyma. Reaching the Arctic Ocean, too late in the season, she was caught in the pack ice, near Wrangell Island for the whole winter, arriving the following spring, with no survivors, among the prisoners. Aboard the Germa, or another of the convict fleet, the prisoners were herded into the holds. Iron grills cut these, into isolated sections, and there were machine gun nests, on the decks. But the main recourse, against riot or rebellion, was the fire pumps, by which the icy ocean water could be, and was directed at the prisoners. The prisoners were tucked under hatches with brief and occasional exceptions, for the whole trip. One reason was that the ships, went through the Straits of La Perouse. They were thus, until 1945, running between Japanese territories, well in sight of land, and among Japanese shipping, and fishing boats. At least one early 1932, case of a prisoner managing nevertheless to jump off, and get picked up is recorded. But normally there was no trouble. The guards put on civilian clothes. The machine guns disappeared from the bridge. The ships even had false papers, made out in case of any incident. A typical hold, is described as having three decks, each containing two level bunks, made of poles. 32 The extent to which, the prisoners were packed in, and the squalor, may be judged from Evgenia Ginsburg's remark, that aboard the Germa, how we longed for the comfort of Van 7, the goods truck, in which she had spent a month, on the way to Vladivostok, from Yerslavl prison, so many pushed in that, there scarcely seemed room to stand into which though they could hardly stir, and could not even turn on their sides, unless they all did it together, fifteen more women, were pushed en route, in which it was so stuffy, that the air felt thick, and greasy, in which the roof of the wagon was red hot, and the nights were not long enough to cool it, in which the only ventilation, was a three-inch gap, closed while in stations, in which the water ration, had been one mug full a day, for all purposes, in which their inadequate, Bread ration had been cut to half, as a penal measure. It was still better than the Germal Asterisk, a male prisoner, working in the sick bay of the Sovletvia, in 1949, tells of conditions aboard. When we reached the women's hold, the entrance was barred by two armed soldiers, but on seeing our Red Cross armbands, they let us pass. We climbed down a very steep, slippery wooden stairway with great difficulty, and finally reached the bottom. It took us some time, to accustom our eyes to the dim light of the dingy lower deck. As I began to see, where we were, my eyes beheld a scene, which neither Goya nor Gustav Dor could ever have imagined. In that immense cavernous, murky hold were crammed more, than two thousand women. From the floor to the ceiling, as in a gigantic poultry farm, they were cooped up in open cages, five of them in each nine-foot square space. The floor was covered with more women. Because of the heat and humidity, most of them were only scantily dressed. Some had even stripped down to nothing. The lack of washing facilities, and the relentless heat, had covered their bodies, with ugly red spots, boils, and blisters. The majority were suffering from some form of skin disease, or other, apart from stomach ailments, and dysentery. At the bottom of the stairway, we had just climbed down stood a giant cask, on the edges of, which in full view of the soldiers standing, on guard above, women were perched like birds, and in the most incredible positions. There was no shame, no prudery, as they crouched there to urinate or, to empty their bowels. One had the impression, that they were some half-human, half-bird creatures, which belonged to a different world, and a different age. Yet seeing a man coming down the stairs, although a mere prisoner like themselves, many of them began to smile, and some even tried to comb their hair. Who were these women? And where had they come from? I asked myself. I soon learned that they had been arrested all over Russia, and those countries of Europe overrun, by Soviet armies. The main accusation, against them was collaboration with the enemy, 31 batten down in the murky holds, there was nothing to see or do. 
nothing, that is, except to survive the activities of the common criminals. Every report of these voyages, tells of little else. Though some of the prisoners had previously come, across this great criminal element, the Urkas, and been terrorized, and robbed in camps, on trains or in the transit camp itself, for many the ships were the scene of their first encounter, with this dreadful underground culture, which had survived, with its own traditions and laws, since the time of troubles at the beginning of the 17th century, and had greatly increased in numbers by recruiting orphans, and broken men of the revolutionary and collectivization periods. One woman tells us, during the entire voyage, which lasted a week, no member of the guard, on the ship's crew, ever entered the prisoner's hold. They were afraid to, especially when a large number of murderers and bandits were being transported, since they were an insignificant, though heavily armed, minority compared to the number of prisoners. They stood with raised guns, ready to fire, when the prisoners were let out on deck, in small groups to use the toilet. None of them, took any account of what went on below decks. As a result, during all such voyages, the criminals put across a reign of terror. If they want the clothing of any of the counter-revolutionaries, they take it from him. If the counter-revolutionary offers any resistance, he is beaten up. The old and weak are robbed of their bread. On every transport ship a number of prisoners die as a result of such treatment. Thirteen General Gorbatov was robbed again. While we were in the Sea of Okutsk misfortune, befell me curly in the morning, when I was lying half awake as many of us did, two trustees, came up to me, and dragged away my boots, which I was using as a pillow. One of them, hit me hard on the chest, and then on the head, and said with a leer, Look at him, sells me his boots days ago, pockets the cash, and then refuses to hand them over. Off they went with their loot, laughing for all they were worth, and only stopping to beat me up again when out of... Sheer despair, I followed them, and asked for the boots back. The other trustees, watched roaring with laughter. Let him have it. Quit yelling, they're not your boots now. Only one of the political prisoners, spoke up. Look, what are you up to? How can he manage in bare feet? One of the thieves took off his pumps, and threw them at me. I had often heard, since I had been in prison, stories about the bestial behavior of the common convicts but to be honest I never thought they would rob with such impunity, in the presence of other prisoners. Anyhow, I lost my boots. Our guards, including their chief, got on well with the trustees, encouraged them to violence and used them to mock the enemies of the people. 3. Some of the most lurid accounts are of the women criminals. Evgenia Ginsberg recalls, in 1939. But the worst was yet to come. Our first meeting, with the real hardened criminals, among whom we were to live at Kolima. When it seemed as though there were no room, left for even a kitten, down through the hatchway, poured another few hundred human beings. They were the cream of the criminal world. Murderers, sadists, adepts at every kind of sexual perversion. To this day I, remain convinced that the proper place, for such people, is a psychiatric hospital, not a prison or a camp. When I saw this half-naked, tattooed ape-like horde, invade the hold, I thought that it had been decided, that we were to be killed off by mad women. The fetid air reverberated to their shrieks, their ferocious obscenities, their wild laughter and their caterwaulings. They capered about, incessantly stamping their feet even carat though, there appeared to be no room, to put a foot down. Without wasting any time they set about terrorizing, and bullying the ladies, the politicals delighted to find that the enemies of the people, were creatures even more despised, and outcast than themselves. Within five minutes, we had a thorough introduction, to the law of the jungle. They seized our bits of bread, snatched the last of our rags, out of our bundles, pushed us out of the places, we had managed to find. Some of us wept, some panicked, some tried to reason with the whores, some spoke very politely to them, hoping to restore their self-respect. Others called for the warders. They might have saved their breath, for throughout the whole voyage, we never saw a single representative of authority other than the sailor, who brought a cartload of bread to the mouth of the hold, and threw our rations down to us as though we were a cage full of wild beasts for a half-blind Polish woman, in 1944, tells. 130 women, were also taken, of whom I was one. In all there were taken five of us Polish women, a few Soviet politicals, and all the rest of that type of criminal which, can be most nearly described by the European expression Apache.
When at last we went aboard it was dark, and I was quite blind. Heavy rain began to fall. Nobody helped me. I was in danger of being left, completely alone on the desolate shore. Another blind woman Soviet, at last came to my aid, and finally a soldier. The idea that I, might have been left behind amused everybody immensely. In the darkness hands reached out towards me, from all sides. One tore off the shawl, the polished shawl I, wore on my head. Others tried to drag off my sweater, and seize my sack. We fought in the darkness of the night, and of my blindness. I hit out at random. Wherever there seemed to be anything soft, I could just make out the lamp swinging. I could taste blood, and I knew that somehow I, must get my back against a wall. I meant to fight to the last. If I once gave an eye, knew they would murder me. As I reached out, and a blow went wide I, fell against a door opening, and the commandant appeared. For the time being I was saved. All the way to Kolima my battle, with the Apache women went on. One befriended me for a while, and then herself completely robbed me. She simply could, not keep it up. Her name was Lola, and she looked like the old female wolf, who leads the pack. Somewhere she had some polished blood too. For the few days that she was my friend, she shared her bread with me. Z-retching, the wild cries, the dancing and stamping of feet, the brawling, fornicating and wild cat fighting, went on night and day. Even the men were afraid of these women. The commandant was afraid of them too. Nevertheless he helped me, to get some things back. I said to one woman, you are so young, you are even beautiful, and yet you are as evil, as the fiend himself. Why? She looked at me, with an expression of which I, can give no idea. Why should I be otherwise? Hell is where I live, and the fiend is my brother. To Eleanor Lipper describes a particular danger, that threat and the political women, from the men criminals. We lay squeezed together on the tarred floor of the hold. Because the criminals had taken possession, of the plank platform. If one of us dared to raise her head, she was greeted by a rain of fish heads, and entrails from above. When any of the seasick criminals, threw up, the vomit came down upon us. At night, the men criminals bribed the guard, who was posted on the stairs, to the hold, to send over, a few women for them. They paid the guard in bread, that they had stolen from their fellow prisoners. Thirteen not only criminals, worked this trade, indeed. Some of the girls had better luck, and were entertained by the captain, the chief mate, the battalion commander, and other officers, who treated themselves to the charms of these. Unfortunate women on their way TP, the wastes of Kolima. Girls were invited to cabins, where they were offered a decent meal, good liquor, and the luxury of a shower, clean towel, and clean bedsheets. They realized of course, that this might be the last chance they would have for such luxuries 31 but sex was not always so peaceable a transaction. In 1944 several hundred young girls, came to Kolima. They were the so-called Yukazniki, sent out here for an authorized absences from a war factory, or for some similar minor offense, the criminals, who formed the greater part of the human freight, aboard this ship, had an absolutely free hand, in the hold. They broke through the wall, into the room where the female prisoners, were kept and raped, all the women, who took their fancy. A few male prisoners, who tried to protect the women, were stabbed to death. Several old men had their bread, snatched from them day after day, and died of starvation. One of the criminals, who appropriated a woman, whom the leader of the band, had marked for his own, had his eyes put out with a needle. Thirteen this in accord, with their own law. Another prisoner, a Polish woman, reports a similar sanction, aboard another ship. From the men's quarters, came cries which surpassed any I, had heard before. The Apache men settling a score, with their knives, a brigade leader had gambled, and lost the brigade's bread ration, at cards. For this, he had been tried by the men, Apaches and found guilty. They literally cut him up with their knives. His brains lay scattered on the decks, too as to the needle-wielding gang. When the ship arrived in Magadan, and the prisoners were driven out of the hold, fifteen were missing. They had been murdered by the criminals during the voyage, and the guards had not lifted a finger. The upshot of this particularly glaring scandal, was that after the facts became known in Magadan, the commander of the ship's guard, was called on the carpet, and arrested. Thirteen on another occasion, in 1949, a bunch of ruffians, had pushed through the rust-weakened bulkhead, into the women's hold, and had tried to rape them. Soldiers had intervened, and some of the rampaging prisoners, had been killed. 
As we filed towards the ship's gangway I observed a few prisoners in chains. They were the ringleaders of the assault on the women's quarters, who had not been shot. Two of them teenagers, were charged with having hanged a woman, who tried to resist their attack. Both looked quite calm, and asked for a smoke. 31 An incident, which is described as taking place on the Jharmu in the latter half of 1939, is given by three prisoners, two Soviet and one Western, none of whom was present but who learnt of it from witnesses. The accounts are slightly different, but the value of authentication, through such evidently independent corroboration, is obvious. We shall come across it again. Miss a Slipper says, The criminals succeeded in breaking through the wall of the hold and getting at the provisions. They robbed the stores and then, to wipe out the traces, set the storeroom on fire. There was a frightful panic among the prisoners who were locked in the hold of the burning ship. The fire was held in check, but the Jharmu entered port still burning. 13 As Miss Ustinsberg describes it, a fire broke out. The male criminals seized the opportunity to try to break out and were battened down into a corner of the hold. When they went on rioting, the crew hosed them down to keep them quiet. Then they forgot about them. As the fire was still burning the water, boiled and the wretched men, died in it. For a long time afterwards the Jharmus tank, intolerably. For the third account, from a woman social revolutionary, is similar. 22 This may, well also be the same occasion, as one given as happening the previous year, in the Gulag archipelago. The thieves aboard got out of the hold, and into the storage room, plundered it, and set it afire. The ship was very close to Japan, when this occurred. Smoke was pouring from it, and the Japanese offered help, but the captain refused to accept it, and even refused to open the hatches. When Japan had been left behind, the corpses of those suffocated, by smoke were thrown overboard, and the half-burned half-spoiled. Food aboard was sent on to camp, as rations for the prisoners, 32 a particularly unpleasant trip. There were other arrivals at Nagevo Harbor, in specially nasty circumstances, as when a convoy of four ships on the first voyage of the season, in 1938, was unable to penetrate the late-lasting ice and disembarked the prisoners so that they had to finish the voyage, on foot over the ice pack, tormented half-dead people, in that grey line. Carrying on their shoulders, other half-dead people sufferers, from arthritis or prisoners without legs, 32 Oregon, on 5th December 1947 the steamer Kim, arrived with the last cargo of the year. On it were 3,000 prisoners who had been drenched with fire hoses during the trip, in the course of putting down some sort of riot. The temperature was 40 C. There were many dead, who were carried by lorries, to the common grave, without post-mortem or certificate, and many more needed amputations, or other treatment. But even the normal arrival, at that coast is always described, as a moment of gloom. Even in August, a sea the color of lead, washed a rock-bound shore, under cliffs up to a thousand feet high. Nagevo, though a splendid external harbor, is outstanding for its harshness even, on the notoriously inhospitable shores, of the Sea of Okhotsk, and for nearly 300 years of Russian settlement it had been left deserted. The prisoners disembarked. The dead and the very sick were laid out on the stony beach, and check. The remainder were formed up for the march, to the Magadan transit camp, a few miles away from the coast. They found themselves in a strange land. Chapter 2 in 2 Kolyma The Kolyma region consists, mainly of the basin of the Kolyma River, which winds northward from its source, in the Jidan or Kolyma range, till it reaches the East Siberian Sea, near Ambarkic, a vast area, about the size of the Ukraine. To this has been annexed a strip of coastal territory, to the south of the watershed, including Magadan, the capital. The climate of this southern strip, where the prisoners arrive, is less extreme than most of the river basin, though cold enough by most standards. The sea, for example, is frozen for scores of miles, out from shore, for five months of the year. Nevertheless the mildness of Magadan, Nagevo and their surroundings, where the temperature has never fallen, below 50 C, is often remarked on by prisoners, coming from northerly areas. General Gorbatov says, when I had first reached Magadan from Vladivostok, it had seemed a wild place to me. Now after Maldyak, Magadan seemed kasi, and the air quite different, as if I had gone in November, from the north of Russia, to Saki on the Black Sea coast. 5. The climate of the interior, where it may go down to. Dot slash 7 OC, is indeed the coldest, in the northern hemisphere. 
The actual pole of cold is at Wangyukan, just over the Chidan. A camp rhyme ran. Kolima, Kolima Chudnaya Planet Advanat Zat Mesyat Sav Zimu Astal Moilito. Kolima, Kolima Wonderful Planet. Twelve months winter asterisk, the rest summer. This is an exaggeration. The brief Arctic summer melts the snow and the soil to a depth of about six feet. In fact the hundred days of the mining season proper take place when the topsoil is at least warm enough to melt fairly easily when a fire is built on it together with the two-month period when it is actually melted. At the same time, the rivers and freeze. But the coal in the summer is almost as treacherous as the winter. The ground becomes warm, especially on the asterisk southern slopes. But in some areas, the swamps may go no deeper than a few feet so that a road worker would be standing in ice while being baked. In addition, the insects are truly abominable, in particular, in the coastal region. One specially large type of gadfly can sting through deer hide and drives horses crazy. The local tribesmen, however accustomed to the insects, always dress heavily and wear mittens and netting over their heads clothing, which was not issued to prisoners after the first few years. The freezing swamps of the upper valleys of the Kolima Basin were variegated by small hills or sopki on which settlements were often built. The main gold deposits are in and around the upper reaches of the Kolima and its tributaries, that is to say, in the more southerly section of the river basin, though the history of the area since 1932 is one of the continual discovery and exploitation of new deposits. The area had been roughly known to the Russians for centuries. The first effective Russian crossing of the Urals came in the 1580s when Yermak led his famous expedition. But within an incredibly short span, they had reached the Pacific. The Kolima Basin itself had been explored by 1615 as Kolimsk, near the mouth of the river, had been founded as a trading post as early as 1644. In fact, paradoxical though it may seem, the far north of Siberia was penetrated and exploited before the more southerly areas. In those days, the north was swarming with every type of fur-producing animal, and in particular the unrivaled sable. Just as the Hudson Bay Company, in parallel circumstances, held a fur trading empire in the far north of western Canada as early as the late 18th century, so in Siberia it was to the Arctic and subarctic lands that the adventurer or merchant were first attracted. The area was held by a handful of widely scattered settlements or forts between which bands of hunters sought out their prey. From 1700, silver and tin mines were operating elsewhere in Siberia, and in 1745 at Nurchinsk, near the Mongolian border, some gold was obtained as a byproduct. Early in the 19th century gold deposits proper were discovered at Nurchinsk, and later in the Unisi and Lena Valleys. It was at first a state monopoly, but private prospecting was allowed. In 1826 and ten years later private operation of gold finds was also allowed, though the gold had to be delivered to the state. With the comparative exhaustion of the first, gold became an important Siberian resource, but it was still on nothing, like the scale that eventually developed in the Kolima Basin. The first gold in Kolima seems to have been found in 1910 when a fugitive convict sold some to a trader. His name, or diminutive, survives Boriska, and the first gold mine was called Boriskin. However nothing was done until in 1925 a white officer called Nikolov, who had been hiding out since the end of the anti-Bolshevik operations in 1922, took advantage of the 1925 amnesty and brought in some platinum. Prospecting parties were now sent into Kolima. By the end of the 20s private traders were bringing interesting quantities down a track over the Jidan to the mouth of the Ola River. It was becoming clear that the Kolima fields were exceptional, something like the equivalent of a Soviet Alaska. Mining began in 1927, at first with free labor, though less than 200 men were involved. The government permitted them free enterprise, and only maintained the old monopoly of gold purchasing. In this, it was outbidden by legal or semi-legal private traders. These were the first to cut a direct route through the Taiga to the Sea of Okhotsk. The government was faced with great difficulty. On the face of it, it could either give concessions to free enterprise, or invest a great amount of capital in the development of the area. But the first was ruled out for political reasons, and there was no capital available. 
The solution was to make use of the one reserve material the government could dispose of human beings. By 1930, when the position became clear, the first great forced labor projects were starting, manned by Kulaks. In December 1931 Dalstroy, the Far Northern Construction Trust, was set up, in charge of all forced labor projects, in the northeast of Siberia. Rheingold Berzin, a Latvian communist, was appointed its head. Dalstroy seems at first to have covered the new Kolyma region only. Eventually gold was also found on the Indijurka, to the west, and this and various other areas of development, such as the Chukitsk Peninsula, gradually came under Dalstroy control. At the height of its operations, Dalstroy, which was an NKVD agency, coming directly under the police ministry, in Moscow, controlled an enormous area, though its headquarters remained at Magadan. This area has never been precisely defined, but it seems to have included all the territory, beyond the Lena north of the Alden, as far as the Bering Straits, a territory four times the size of France, and if it is true, that in 1953 Dalstroy's then-chief Derevenko was held responsible for the labor camp rebellion at Norilsk, it must then have stretched as far west as the Unisi and controlled a region as large as non-Soviet Europe. In all this vast area, the normal Soviet administration did not operate, and Dalstroy itself was in charge of all the activities of government. Thus in Dalstroy's early days, its head simultaneously controlled the Kolyma camps. As its operations spread, its head had a deputy responsible specifically for the Kolyma camps, whose post was head of Uzvital the administration of the Northeastern Corrective Labor Camps. After Berzin fell in 1937, if we may anticipate, he was replaced as head of Dalstroy, by Pavlov, while the ill-famed Major Gronin, became head of Uzvital and responsible, for the Kolomu operations proper. Gronin was shot in 1939. His successors fell rapidly, Vishnevetsky coming to grief, with a disastrous first attempt, to open up the Pestra Dresvu area, in 1940. Meanwhile Pavlov had fallen, apparently owing to a quarrel with Beria, about production plans, and he was replaced by the dreadful Ivan Nikishov, who seems to have held the post until the end of the war. His successor Major General Derevenko, lasted until 1953, about the end of the era. Known successive heads of the two organizations are, with approximate dates. Dalstroy Uzvital E.P. Berzin, 1932-7 I.G. Filipov, 1937-K. A. Pavlov, 1937-40 Magronin, 1938-9 I.F. Nikishov, 1940-6 Mayegorov, 1939-40 P.P. Derevenko 1946-53 Kol Vishnevetsky 1940 Kol Gokov 1941 Kol Drabkin 1942 in 193 1-2 the decision was taken to base the campaign to exploit Kolomu on the splendid harbor of Nagevo several miles long and well protected from the wind by its high cliffs in spite of its other disadvantages. It was impossible to build a real settlement at Nagevo, so the operational base was set up beyond the cliffs, some miles inland in a swampy area, on the edge of the polar taiga. Here in the early 30s, the settlement of Magadan was begun. In the summer of 1932, the operation was launched. The collectivization assault on the peasantry had produced a vast expansion in the number of arrests. Of the 10 million kulaks disposed of half probably died, in famine and by execution, and of the remainder certainly no fewer, than 3 carat million, poured into the prison camps. Kolima got its share. Throughout the navigational season scores of thousands of prisoners, were put ashore at Nagevo. It was a typical operation of the time, in that it was insufficiently prepared, the conditions had not been adequately investigated, and the program was impossibly ambitious. This had to be made up, for by simple human wave tactics, though the prisoners were treated ruthlessly, it was not with the mean, and vicious ruthlessness of later years. They were not deprived of food, and clothing simply to procure their destruction. It was rather that, since everything else took priority, over the prisoners' well-being, they were for example, made to live in tents while hewing, and placing the pier stones, cutting roads through the rocks, and beginning to set up the buildings of Magadan. This was of course, the period in which the Soviet Union, was engaged in the struggle, for collectivization and industrialization, and famine ravaged the rural areas. 
Supplies were naturally short for everybody, and prisoners were the first to suffer. The ration at this time was, two pounds of bread, hot soup in the morning, fatless gruel at noon, hot water at night. The winter of 1932-3 was exceptionally severe, with blinding snowstorms. It was impossible, at times even to walk from one house to another in the middle of Magadan itself. The camps set up in the Taiga were often completely cut off. Supplies failed, and in some camps, when communications were restored, it was found that no one was left, not even the dogs. According to one story a convoy lost its way in the Shadinsky Valley, and died several thousand prisoners, with their guards, to a man. Survivors of the first year said that only one, out of 50 or 100, of those thrown, into the first mass assault on the Koalima Gold came back. One prisoner records. In March 1933, 600 prisoners were sent to gold mine number one of the mining administration of the north. There were two other administrations of the same kind, those of the west and the south. We set off on foot on this long journey. We had to travel 370 miles in deep snow and during territy cold weather to the Cotton Aksopka. We had to make 16 miles a day, after which we spent the night in tents set up on the snow. After our scanty rations, in the morning, we set out again. Those who were unable to survive this long grueling march, and died on the way, were left with the snow, for their only tomb. Our guards forbade us to give them, a proper burial. Those who lagged behind were shot by the guards, without stopping the column. For thirty long days, we trudged along over the immense expanses of snow, arriving at last exhausted at the Sopku of Kotanik, where we were quartered, in tents already awaiting us then, when the navigation season, opened again in 1933 the new prisoners, were sent up along the winter route, to build the highway, to Shrednikan and thence to Smjan, where the Kolima becomes navigable. This had the usual difficulties of road construction, in a land of rivers and mountains, but in addition the thaw, which now melted the upper levels of the permafrost, made the whole ground intractably difficult. One section of the highway hardly a mile long is said to have swallowed over 80,000 beams and even years later was far from being firmly established, requiring repairs every year. These problems had not been properly allowed for. And moreover, the route chosen from a too sketchy survey proved impractical, and a considerably longer one had to be followed. As a result the road was two years behind schedule, and was only properly finished in 1937. The heavy work on the roads and in the newly opened mining areas took its toll among the exhausted prisoners. The summer of 1933 is said to have cost more in human lives than even the previous winter. In 1934, the situation improved somewhat, and in 1935 Berzin was able to start the exploitation of Kolima on a rational basis. And now, for a couple of years, until late 1937 Kolima went through what Shalimov calls its golden age. All prisoners' accounts agree that Berzin instituted a system by which the labor of the prisoners was efficiently, and as far as conditions permitted, humanly used. It is said that he sought and obtained special permission from Stalin for this exceptionally careful handling of human resources, to the maximum advantage. For he saw that a prisoner, who was warm, well-fed, and not overworked was likely to be more productive. And Stalin, at the time, needed gold from Kolima more than he needed its punitive capacity. Under this regime gold production naturally soared. We have spoken of the harshness of the Kolima climate. But it is not unhealthy to men, kept well fed, and properly clothed. One prisoner sent there in 1935, who had become tubercular in jail and transit camp says that his tuberculosis was actually cured by the climate, and that a doctor at Vladivostok had predicted this. Shalimov tells us of excellent nourishment, good clothing, four to six hours, work in winter, ten hours in summer. Lipper speaks of the food, as adequate when arrival of supplies, was not hampered by transportation difficulties and prisoners who worked well were entitled to additional food, bought at the camp commissary. Vodka was even provided in the ration, during the cold weather, as both Lipper and Petrov tell us. Even more important, Lipper confirms that in winter, the prisoners were given fur coats, fur caps and warm, felt boots. At the same time, the prisoners received good pay, Shalimov. See the prisoners, were well paid, Petrov.
They were able to send money to their families. Berzin even provided a non-material incentive. Shalimov tells us that the count of labor days was managed in such a way that prisoners condemned for 10 years were let out after two or three. At this point, indeed this Soviet witness, who like Lipper but unlike Petrov, was not there before 1937, oversimplifies the degree of liberalization. Possible even in the most liberal of Stalinist periods and places. Lipper has to qualify all her comments with the remark that in general, asterisk even in those days how